I was born January 3rd, 1924. Okay. Um, you served in the military, so could you tell us where you served and what branch? I served in the Army in Europe. Okay. In World War II. Yeah, I'd be that. All right. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you brought? These are not original, I don't think. But this instrument here is, has the surrender of Japan. It's the surrender of Japan. And I don't... Oh, it's, the, it's the surrender of Japan. I don't know if... I, it's probably not an original, but it's, it's the same as the, as the surrender would be of Japan. There's probably many of these out, I suppose, but I thought this might be interesting to somebody. If you want to read them, you know, if you want to read them. This one is the surrender of Germany mm -hmm. in World War II. So anybody would like to see that? I mean, it's maybe not... Maybe not important after all these years, but you know, still, yeah. some people like to read it. Yeah, it's just, right. yeah. There's probably several people have got this too. This is a plaque that was sent to me, well, about two or three years ago, for those who, who was in the, the liberation of France. And this is a, a diploma they're sending you for your gratitude, for their gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody wants to read it. If I want to read it in English, I've got the English on the back of it here. It's a sub in French, and I can't understand it, so I. So, okay. what, you served in France? No, I, well, I served in I served in Europe, and we served in, in France, and and uh, I was we was in uh, Central Europe, and uh, northern northern France, and Central Europe, and I I was in three major battles. That's all. Just three. Yeah. What What do you remember about that? What What are your biggest memories from serving in Europe? Oh. <laughs> And you're, if you're in the infantry, there aren't too many great memories, you know, that's the only thing. There's not too many great memories when you're in the infantry, but there were times when uh, you liberate something and you liberate, everybody's happy and everybody's glad, everybody's hugging and kissing you or something, it's great. But uh, the thing is, you, you wonder sometimes, as you go in, am, the thing is, you think, am I going to be here tomorrow? Am I going to be here the next minute? And uh, people have said, I know what I'm going to do when the war's over. I kept thinking this was never going to be over because you're up there, you know, all the, when you're in the infantry you're every day, all day long, and you think. I did see, uh, and this is where I, I don't know if you'd like to hear this or not, but I was next. The fellow next to me got hit in the throat, and he was bleeding. He was hard for medics. There were no medics around because they were probably busy with someone else. And in a case like that, you know, you can't help him because you know where he's at, where he's hit at, and you know there's nothing you can do for him. So I got to lay there, just watch him die. That's all. And it's a, after you do it after a couple of times like that, you think something like that happens. You think, Gosh Almighty, you know. And you think, Is this going to be me next? I also know of a case where, when we were going in to relieve the 82nd Airborne, one guy looked at me and he says, Welcome to hell. I had no idea what he meant. So I tried to get in there for a while, you know. And uh, these are things that come up to come to you, and you think, Gee whiz, you know, I. I don't realize what that means, but uh, you read this after a while. I uh, I also think the times when you move out, we you move, you get ready, you come back for replacements. You're supposed to get some relax relaxation. They did at one time, and we were called back for replacements. And it's Thanksgiving time. They said you're going to have Thanksgiving dinner, but about early, really early in the morning, somebody comes up and said we got to move out. You get Thanksgiving dinner later. Well, I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Where did you move out to? Pardon? Where did you have to move out to? I don't know. We don't know. So they, don't, they don't usually tell you that. The, now, the operational law knows that. But the reason they don't tell you most of the time is if you get captured, you don't know anything. You know, might know where you went, but you don't know what, you know. So a lot of times they don't really give you too many. They say we're moving and we're going so far, we're going to go into this town or that town. But they don't give you a lot of a lot of information. Sometimes they do. I've seen some. I've seen the seventy-five millimeters blow a big hole in the house, blow a whole house up. We said, "Town, you know, we went in there." And sometimes you go into a town and say everything's cleaned up, but you get in there and whew, everything's gone. You know, you're, it's not cleaned out at all. The next time you say you're going to be a lot of resistance, you don't meet anything. So it, you know, the records are no. You don't always know what you're going to do. And I think it, uh, I, you know, I. I think my my mom had four of us boys in the service. I had three other brothers in the service. Yeah, and uh, one was one was in Korea, 
and uh, one was in one was in the another, one was in the army, one was in the air force, and I had one in the marines. Three brothers. So we, we had a lot of stories to tell. But I, I think that being in the service, I think really was something I never would. I'd never give it up. I never would want to do it again. But I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I think the military would be good for anyone. If they get in the military, they learn, they learn a lot about our country. We live in the best country in the world, the best piece of ground in the world, but we don't take care of it. We've got it too easy, we've got a lot of soft. We just figure things are going to happen, you know. And we, we think about a war, sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it isn't. And there's a lot of mistakes made in war. Things that didn't have, could, wouldn't, could have been different if someone had got better information or better, you know, so I even understand sometimes I saw a documentary from on the History Channel one time of all the mistakes that the service, Na Army, Navy, and Marines made during World War II. Mistakes they wouldn't have had to, and things they would have, could have done that didn't do would have helped save some lives. So in a war it's like anything else, you don't know for sure what's, what's going to happen. And I'm not that's why I don't want to talk too much about the infantry because it's not a great life. The infantry isn't. You're out in the cold and the wet and the rain. It's snowing. You got. There's nowhere to get in. You have nowhere to take a bath. You have nowhere to go to the bathroom. You know, so those things happen, and people don't realize that. That are people who are never been in. They don't know that. They don't. They realize those things happen. And a lot of times you have to be be careful with your food, your drink, get a little canteen of water. You better make sure you held on to because you may not get any for a while. So um, I don't regret it, but I think sometimes that, that uh, I know my wife said a lot of times, she said, she told my, 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 my oldest son, she said, him and her used to go out sometimes, and I'd go out and just go out for, I mean, I'd go out and drive in some place to stop and sit and get out someplace to be by myself. And uh, a couple of times I, I was on a farm for a while, I went up in the woods, sitting under the trees and think, you know, we was in the hurricane, we was in the hurricane forest. And the shells were landing in there, splintering trees, trees were flying all over the place. And it was a dark, it was a dark place, terrible, bad place to be. So you sit up, sitting up in the woods and think, oh boy, this is great, isn't it? The breeze is blowing through the trees, there's no, nothing, no. And sometimes my wife would look for me. I'd be doing something, you know. I'd eat good cars sometimes and just drive and drive and just. No, I didn't want to be, didn't want to be bothered. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. I I think it may be some. Every every everybody who comes back is has a different thing. Some guys go to booze. Some guys go to you know drugs. Um, I'm not you know I drink I drink a little too. I, everybody does. I think it comes up most everybody. Uh, I think it's the tenseness. Or it's the tenseness. I don't know if it's the tenseness of being in and on from one day to the next. Whether you're going to be alive or here or what's going to happen to you, and. I'm not one. Uh, I'm I'm pretty easy going most of the time, but I sometimes you get really nervous. I was in I was in a machine gun outfit. I was in what they call a heavy weapons company. It's not really heavy weapons; it's heavier. The the rifle would carry BARs, Browning automatic rifles, and they have the 60 millimeter mortars. We had the we had the 31 caliber water cooled machine guns, and it had the 81 millimeter mortars. And our job was in support of the, of the infantry, but and I, that's just a, a, a thing of what we did. It's not I'm not interested in telling you all the details of what happens, but uh, to be in the, to be in the infantry, like I said, is not a very nice, but not a very good job. And I so I usually I want to tell them though, this country's great. It's the greatest country in the world. Can sorry I ask about, you sorry about, about that. The liberation experience huh? being. Can I ask? Could you talk a little bit about be, having a lip, you know being in a city or a place that was liberated? Just kind of what you remember. Oh yeah, you we, remember. Well, usually when you come into a city, you're liberated. See, I you know it, people holler, yelling, and you ever been to a, a baseball game where all of a sudden you guys hit the home run with bases loaded? Everybody, that's what it feels like to be in a city like that. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's happy. Everybody's everybody. Talk to everybody. They're kissing you. They're hugging you, and they're so happy that this happened. You know. What city? Do you remember what cities? You oh were? no, I don't remember what cities. All well, cities we were in. <laughs> we went. Last time we went through a town, I don't remember some of the cities we were in. 
for to tell you the truth, I, I'm trying to think of some of the cities. We were a lot of them were just small towns, you know. And uh, when you go to a city like Paris, well, that's great, you know, because I spent uh, some time in a hospital on 140th General in Paris. After I got wounded, they sent me back to, I got, I got, I was in two mass units. They sent me from here to Paris, first to Paris. And I, uh, I had eventually got past it to get out of to go around in Paris, in the town of Paris. And Paris is a great town, but, you know, but. Uh, what did you do? Huh? What did you do? What did I do? When you had your leave in Paris. Oh, we did, we, we did a lot of things. Nah, I, I don't think I want to go into detail. We did a lot of things in Paris, you know. Uh, the thing is about this, we didn't know anybody. We couldn't talk French. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always went out in Paris at two, three, or four. Never go out by yourself. Mm -hmm. But we had a lot of fun in Paris. We had a lot of fun in Paris. We talked to uh, get the kids come up to you and ask you different things, you know. And you would, by the you didn't unless they could, you could understand what they were saying. A lot of times you couldn't understand them, but you knew what they wanted. So, you know, uh, and go to places like that. There's not much else to do but just go to go to a movie. You couldn't understand it. You went to a so you couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So anything you went to, you couldn't understand the language. You could read. So it was it was fun, but uh, at the same time, you didn't have. You, you couldn't do the things you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Really do them right. Yeah. yeah. I, I I I shouldn't tell you this, but you know we went we were, whenever we came in from leave from being out in Paris. <laughs> I know it's good. We'd be out in Paris. We would come back to. To the base, to back to the hospital, they had a big trough. Everybody went to take a pro. Everybody, but then they said, "I didn't do anything. Don't matter." They took no chances that somebody was going to come with a venereal disease. So that's that's one of the things we did that, that, that they forced you to do. The, the, government, the, the government wanted that because they didn't want to. See, World War One, they had a lot of disease, a lot of disease. So they didn't want that to happen again in World War Two. And I imagine it's happening up to Korea and Vietnam the same way. They would not take no chances. So, uh, I hope you edit some of this. <laughs> but that's just something to tell you what, some of this that goes on. And uh, we, uh, we, we just were small towns. Like I said, we were small towns. We were, uh, I got wounded in Bergstein, Germany. It's right in the rural, the rural rivers vicinity. Do you remember the circumstances of your, your getting wounded? Oh, yeah, I was, uh, we were, uh, we were guarding a pillbox, and we had we were set up in a building. We, we were set up uh, in the basement, but we had the gun set up outside of an op opening. And uh, early in the morning, I think it was a uh, probably a, I don't know if it was a murder shot or what it was. Hit me, come through the doorway, and got me. I don't know where it came from. Knocked me down, and I. I crawled over. We, sitting, we had to open a trap door and go down to the base. I, I stopped and I went and yelled down. I said, "I think I'm hit." And so they, they come up. The charge came up right away. We got down there. And so he, he took, he took, dragged me down. He dragged me down in the basement. Another guy came up and took my place. And he, uh, he said, "No, Bill, this was early in the morning, maybe about oh, daybreak." He said, "Bill, the, the middies can't come and get you." He said, because they can't come across that snow. It was in the was January. Mm. Excuse me. He said, they can't, come, they can't come through that snow and pick you up till tonight, when after it's dark. So I was there all, all day. They come and got me tonight and put me in a six by a, a half track. You know what a half track is? It's got wheels and it's got tracks on the back of it. Mm. That's where they loaded us in there. We, they took me to the mesh unit. And we was, in there, we was, there, we was all lined up. Some of us in litters and some of us just coming in. It was crippled, you know, he was walking. And they, they said, well, I think we can send this guy back. We'll fix him up and send him back. I, I, guess, I was thinking, oh, boy. <laughs> so I come out when I got there. And he said, no, nah, this guy's got to go. We've got to take him. So they sent me up. They sent me back to aid the master unit. And I was there for, I don't know what happened. I got come out of it. I was all, everything was done. Now, I often think, I'd like to know who the doctors were, you know. But uh, but I never knew so when they, when they fixed me. And it, I think we had to give credit to someone else too, the nurses. The nurses in the hospital did a wonderful job. A lot of us surrendered, we couldn't walk, we couldn't move around. They had to do everything for you. Mm -hmm. 
And many times you were in pain, and the nurses were right there, and the nurses didn't give you a hard time, maybe they tried to make you feel good. That's why I think the last time we hear about the guys who get the Purple Heart, I get a Purple Heart, and they get a, get a big ribbon or a big award, but the nurses deserve a lot for what they did for us. The, the doctor fixed you up, but the nurse took care of you after you were in the hospital. And I think the hospital, I think the bed room I was in, there's about 48 or 50 beds in there. And the nurses, there was several nurses, but they had sometimes it was out 24 hours a day, they was around the clock. Mm -hmm. Had a desk right there, you know, if anything, anything happened. So, uh, and they never knew if something was going to happen. Some of them would need, a, need help. So, that, that's something I think that people should think about. They did a wonder, they did a good job. And they had a hard job sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, I, I hope people will think about that. I hope you edit some of this now. I hope you don't use this all now. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll edit. <laughs> what, what do you remember about coming back? Well, we came back. We left. We came back to Newport News, Virginia, and we were there in a big, big, big auditorium. And they got up and they, they introduced the thing. person introduced themselves, who who he was, and what rank he. We could see what rank he was. He said, "One thing I want to tell you, fellas, right now, if you're going to go to the mess hall, and you're going to have something to eat." But he says, from now on, when you come in, when you're in this, when you're in this camp here, he says, if you, anybody you see will salute you first. You don't salute anyone, not even officers. And I thought, gee, well, this is great, you know. So he said, don't, if, you, if they don't salute you, they don't have to worry about it. He said, you just, you can salute anybody that comes, they salute you first. That was something to think about, you know, because, hey, you know, you always used to see an officer, you didn't salute an officer, and stop you. Tell you, hey, you know. And you, you, you get drop and give me something like that, you know. And you, so and that was a, that was one thing I remember about that. But we, it was a good place. To, it was a good big camp, big camp, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I left there, left there, because I was home in Fort for a while. Then we went to Fort Leonard, Missouri. We were scheduled to go to San Diego, to Japan. But we got to Missouri, and they said the war is over in Japan, so you don't have to go. And I, you know, we felt good about that, but. We get a break. We got a break there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, that's the story of my life. Uh, <laughs> so you came home and... I came home, yeah. I came home and... No plaudits. I didn't come home to no... no, no but uh, I... Uh, I was home about 1947. I got... I met my wife in 1946. I married her. In 1947 we got married. We were married 60 years. Hmm. She did a lot of crap, don't she? <laughs> do, do your children ask you this how? Oh, they don't say that. My kids. I had well, my oldest son was in was in Korea mm -hmm. or Vietnam. He was in the Vietnam. He graduated in '68. He was one of the first ones to be called to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I told him I said, Joe, go enlist in the Air Force. Why? Well, because if you get in the Army, you're going to be. You might be. I said, I don't want this to be in the infantry. That's where I probably push you. So he did. He went enlisted in the Air Force, and he got a nice job out of it. Yeah, and my uh, yeah, and I said, well, I think that he uh, he got it. He got been he was there for a couple of years, I guess. He came out and uh, he, he he had a good job. He got a good job out of it. yeah. Good. And he was got his in the Air Force. And I one time my uh, telephone rang. I was working afternoons. I hope you know. <laughs> anyway, I was working afternoons. The telephone rang. And the guy says, "This is Sergeant So and So. Is that talked to your son Jimmy about listening in the army?" I said, no, "What are you talking about?" Well, I said, I said, you know, we go in the army, we give you whatever you want. I said, no, you don't. I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, you don't give. Them. I said, when they get in there, they tell you all they're going to do for you. You get in, there, you might be, you might be a, a dog face. Said, what do you mean? I said, you might be in an infantry. No, we don't. Do. I said, don't tell me that. I said, he said, you sure that? I said, yes, sir. I said, I was a sergeant in the U.S. Army in World War II. Boom it up, <laughs> hang up. And my, my boy said to me, Jimmy said, maybe they said that. I told him about this. No way. I wonder why that guy never called me back. He said he told me he's going to call me back and talk to me about it. And that's why he didn't call me back. <laughs> so, so those are the things you know happened to me. That I remember and that guy. I charged as soon as I said bang the, the hook went the, the, the phone bang went down because he knew the, he knew I was he wouldn't have to talk to Jim. He could talk to him, but I told him, he knew Jimmy already knew it because I told him what was going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. And I said he was your list. They tell you to give what you want, but that don't mean anything, you know. Once they got you in there, they got they got you by the horns and you got to go. So he he didn't do it. Yeah, 
And I said, I can say, I, I got to say, I give my wife credit for sticking me for 60 years. She said, you know, women who marry sometimes, I don't know, every, not every soldier, but in my case, and a lot of guys in the infantry, especially, their wives had a lot of stuff because they really, some of them, I didn't, but a lot of guys had real, real problems, real, real problems. And it wasn't their fault, but everybody blames them. You say, well, you know, I, but that really their fault. Mm-hmm. Your feelings are not the same when you come out as it was when you went in. You have a little different attitude. Not enough, but you have a, good, a nice attitude of your country. You believe in the worth of your country. And I said it before, you believe in the best piece of country in the world. If we don't take care of it, we're going to lose it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, sorry, but I mean, no, no, <laughs> Uh, anything else you want to, that comes to mind? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, Do you remember being uh, called to duty? And, oh, yeah. Uh, where were you? See, and, the first time I was called to duty was in June, after I graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. And I got to take my physical. I told him I had a hernia. And I asked him, what do I have to do? And he said, go get a fix. So I went and got a fix, and I went in the following January, I got called. So I didn't make it the first time, but I didn't even know I had a hernia. They found it. And, uh, so, uh, but I remember when I, but I remember getting when I left my mom says now let me know where you're going but she didn't know when I got down we went to Port Hayes we got our orientation I went to Port Hayes down to Cape Landing, Florida we get down and says you guys are quarantined you can't call nobody you can't write to nobody I think what for three weeks or something like that. boy my mom was going to be mad cause she, but I couldn't do it that's the way it was you know you couldn't tell no phone calls no letters no nothing you stay right here in the base so it was kind of a tough, tough deal, especially when you first time you've been in our service. You think, boy. Mm-hmm. And we get down to Florida. They said, well, we had ODs on. ODs are winter uniforms. I love that. We get down to Florida. They said, we're sorry, but our summer suits, our summer uniforms didn't come in yet. But it'll be a little while before you get. We were down to Florida with those ODs on. You, <laughs> they said, your uh, summer uniforms will be coming here in, in a few days. They said, but see, even a few days in the hot. Uh, you know, you know, and it still made you work out. You didn't get off just because you had the ODs on. Yeah, I said, so I, that's some experiences. I think he's, it's, it's kind of funny now, but that time it wasn't funny. You're down there sweating the ODs and they're working, you know, you got to keep working here and want to the rest, you know. One other thing I'll say before I leave. We were all lined up one time in the company area. The lieutenant come out and he says to the guy, he said, what, what's your nationality? The guy said, well, I like French and said, German. Italian, Greek. He said, what are you doing in the American Army? He said, what do you mean? You're not Italian. You're not, your nationality is American. You're born in America. You're an American. You're not a Greek. Or he said, you, that, you, you, that's, that's your, you know, is that, that, uh, that's your, your, your nationality. But he said, you're not, you're not Greek. You're, you're American. He said, anybody born in America is American. He said, everybody says, what's your nationality? He said, Greek. He said, well, you're not Greek. Yeah, he said, you're, you're an American. Yeah, your descendants are Greek, but you're not. Mm-hmm. And that's true, you know. And he said to one time, someone said, well, I don't say who Muslims, I hope you don't, but they were saying, kill, kill, kill Christians and Jews. I see the piece that said, when you kill Americans, who do you kill? You kill Polacks, you kill Germans, you kill French, because America's not, we're all mixed up, you know. So when you kill Americans, you're killing, you know, you might be killing some of your own people. Yeah, and the flag flies great. I like to see. I fly the flag nearly every day. Mm. I, sorry about that. I didn't mean to take up too much of your time, but <laughs> my wife will see. If she sees this, she's going to say, What did you tell them that for? I said, Well, they asked me for the truth that I got to give them. I give them what it was, that's all. And I don't. You know, but I, I'm, I, uh, I belong to a lifetime member of, of the disabled American veterans. I'm a lifetime member of this. this 3747. And I'm also a member of American Legion Post 667. I was, I was a commander, vice commander and chaplain of that, of that, of the American Legion. Here I work with their honor guard. And one of the members of their honor guard. And the honor guard's a great bunch of guys. Great bunch of guys, yeah. yeah. yeah okay.